This is one chapter of the North Shoreline of our DVD, also featuring the South Shore, CA&E, Chicago Streetcar Lines, the Milwaukee Electric Line, and much more. This railroad was a fast and convenient way. Steam roads between those points just could not compete. In Milwaukee, the North Shore station was right down the street from some fine hotels. In Chicago, the North Shore electric trains by 1919 used the elevated or L trackage into downtown Chicago and around the loop. These are early L cars riding tracks suspended on steel girders over busy city streets. Third floor office and apartment dwellers could look at passing steel wheels out their windows. L patrons had a fantastic scenic view gliding over the Chicago River. This North Shore Electroliner had trackage rights on the L, and it made shopping, a night at the opera built by Samuel Insull, or a restaurant and nightclub far more convenient than taking the Chicago and Northwestern or Milwaukee Road steam trains to their busy stations. Here, a 1915 Brill-built number 151 is at Tower 18 on the famous Chicago L Loop. From here, we'll go to the other endpoint in Milwaukee, 86 miles to the north. This was one of the shops in the Milwaukee Harrison Street Yard with 701, a Cincinnati car company built unit from 1922. The original name hidden behind the North Shore sign is C&ME Railroad Company for the Chicago and Milwaukee Electric Railroad Company. The C&ME Railroad became the Chicago, Milwaukee and North Shore in 1916 when electric power plant mogul Samuel Insull acquired control of the line. Let's go all the way to the back of the terminal station in downtown Milwaukee at 6th Street and West Michigan Street back in 1962, with about a year left before abandonment. Here we can make out three station tracks, each with a built-in inspection pit. This is the back side of the station. Parked here are three silver liners. Their trolley poles indicate that they have just arrived. These silver liner cars were built by Pullman between 1928 and 29, but the painted silver sides to simulate fluted stainless steel were added in 1950 to modernize the looks. The flagman here keeps auto traffic at bay, and with his stick, he can change the track switches here when needed. This is a vintage front view of the North Shore Station and its entrance to the station at West Clybourne in West Michigan. This is around 1922. The sky is noticeably gray here from all the smoke from coal burned in nearly every heater back then. To the right are ancient autos and a city streetcar. Back then the North Shore had 35 express baggage motors. This one looks like it had been converted into a work trailer. These carried important high-value goods and perishables. Newspapers from the two major cities were distributed by interurban rail lines back when a city like Chicago could boast of numerous newspapers. Mail was also carried between cities at times. Adjacent to the passenger station was a large early-day intermodal facility. Express box motors and the baggage section of passenger motors were loaded on one side of this facility and trucks as well as horse-drawn wagons of goods were checked in for train loadings on the other side. As you can see, these early 1920s still had plenty of horse-drawn delivery wagons in business. Soon after the end of 1963, nothing in these scenes would be left. Panning the camera reveals a cityscape that is totally gone today. If you could fly a drone to this very spot in the air today, you wouldn't recognize a thing. Plus, the air is far cleaner since switching to electricity and natural gas for heating. This is the backside of the station where trains terminated back in 1962. Four decades after our 1920s scene, everything looks different except the railroad itself. The lead unit is a 1917-built passenger baggage motor by Jewett Car Company. Jewett was founded in Jewett, Ohio, but this car was built in their New Jersey plant. 
The second unit is a 1928 Pullman built car. This is the legendary Electroliner. Two sets of these were designed and built in 1941 by St. Louis Car Company. Notice how the sides taper in at the bottom so they could clear the platforms on the Chicago L. These were fast and smooth running commuting missiles that could easily run at 90 plus miles an hour. The speed indicator instrument could indicate up to 130 miles an hour. While on board, you and 145 others could dine on Electro Burgers and other items and relax in the tavern lounge area while racing by blurred scenery on some of the best and smoothest track of that era. These sets were articulated having a total of five dual axle trucks where normally eight would be expected on four separate units. These could easily manage tight turns on city streets and on the L in and around the loop area. Designing something that agile that was stable up to 110 mile an hour top speed was a real engineering accomplishment. Leaving Milwaukee Station, Silver Liner 742 heads south over the 6th Street Viaduct Crossing over the Milwaukee Road Freight Yard and Industrial Area. Just ahead, the drawbridge crosses the river. Let's take a ride over the viaduct on a southbound Electroliner all the way to downtown Chicago. After crossing the river, a brief length of private right-of-way shifts us over to 5th Street. We come to a traffic light stop. From the downtown terminal, this section was the worst time-consuming bottleneck until we reached Harrison Street Yard. Good idea, but it may be more important to move the crane first. Finally, we make it to the private railroad property and run through the Harrison Avenue yard area. You can see the Chicago and Northwestern and Milwaukee Road railroads down on the left. We cross over the Chicago and Northwestern railroad tracks twice here. Up ahead is the old Heil truck body manufacturing plant before it moved to Alabama. This double track line briefly necks down to one track over this bridge using a gauntlet track. It's double track the rest of the way. Next up is one of the North Shore's power substations. Carrollville was once the location of a glue factory and indeed it did recycle old horses into that product. The factory was built by Peter Cooper, the man that designed the first U.S.-built steam locomotive in 1830 called the Tom Thumb. This is what 90 miles an hour looks like now that we are up to speed. We slow down into Racine, Wisconsin. Racine is French for root. This is where the Root River empties into Lake Michigan. We are 23 miles south of Milwaukee now. Next stop is Kenosha, Wisconsin in 10 more miles. But first, we cross the Chicago and Northwestern tracks at Racine Junction.
To the right, an interchange track peels off and on the left is the interlocking tower. Up ahead is a North Shore local freight switching out a few cars for one of the few online customers the North Shore had. If traditional freight business had been at a higher level, the North Shore may have survived longer. Before the Kenosha station, we pass by the old Nash automobile plant. It generated a lot of freight business, but unfortunately, it all went to the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. This plant began building new cars again after spending World War II building over 17,000 Pratt & Whitney R2800 fighter plane engines here. One of the new post-war cars looked like this, one of the first cars actually tested in a wind tunnel. In later years, the Nash line was replaced with Rambler. Their cars were moving into a different look by the 1960s. This factory view is just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. It was a massive and sprawling affair on both sides of these North Shore tracks. Now the factory is gone and with it thousands of factory jobs. This is the nearby Kenosha North Shore Station. It was designed by Arthur Gerber. He designed many station styles for Samuel Insull's various electric rail lines including the South Shore, the CA&E and North Shore line. We'll pull into the Kenosha station. Off to the right are a pair of steel coil cars from the DT&I Railroad on a siding. This is Zion, Illinois, and we have just crossed over the state line. This is Waukegan, Illinois. We have traveled 48 miles by now. Off to the right was a large coal silo complex. Tracks on that side stored cars mostly for supporting the old shoreline route. We will continue on the newer Skokie Valley route designed to support fewer road crossings and higher speeds. Approaching us is the second Electroliner train set already slowing down for the Waukegan stop. Shore Junction is where the old shoreline cuts into the newer Skokie Valley line. 
Passengers could transfer between trains here if they needed to. Near North Chicago Junction was Pettibone Yard. This was a freight and maintenance yard facility. Let's see some of the freight motors waiting assignments. 452 was a 1918 General Electric freight motor known as a steeple cab configuration. Four fifty nine was one of two built in nineteen forty one by the Oregon Electric Railway, and they were sold to the North Shore by nineteen forty seven. A pair of trucks were at each end on flat cars that pivoted at these two locations. With eight powered axles, it normally ran two trolley poles at the same time. It used as much power as any two steeple cab units when pulling a long train. This is looking south down the West Great Lakes Station on the newer Skokie Valley Line. This is where sailors in training could catch a train from the Great Lakes Naval Training Base on Lake Michigan. Let's pull into this Arthur Gerber designed station. Now we can hop off our electroliner and watch a few trains run by at a location around Lake Bluff, Illinois. The first train will be the opposing direction electroliner heading up to Milwaukee. Off to the right is a long Chicago and Northwestern freight train. The older units could never outrun an electroliner, but they could still keep a 70 mile an hour sustained run. Paralleling the North Shore trains was the competing Chicago and Northwestern Railroad with its long-distance diesel-powered trains. Their performance seemed much more leisurely than that of the Northwestern trains through here. In a bolder era, a North Shore passenger swings off the steps even before the train has stopped.
Another line was added, out to Mundelein in 1926. In the next scene, we will be back on board again as we run past the Mundelein branch off point on our right at South Upton Junction, but we will stay on course to Chicago. When the North Shore Line was in the hands of Samuel Insull, the electric power generation plants to support the electric rail lines were all part of the same total empire he controlled. All along the right-of-way, you will see many high-tension power line towers. Insull was a pioneer in creating the power grid system we know of today. All the unmanned electric substations that stepped the high voltage AC down to the 650 volts DC on the North Shore were controlled from a single room in the Highland offices, another North Shore innovation. What remains remarkable is how smooth this well-maintained track and roadbed really was. This camera work was the remaining proof of that excellence. Remember that this isn't continuous modern welded rail, but it consisted of 39 foot long pieces bolted together at their ends. Every joint needed checking and tightening as required by constant inspection. If you want to see the next chapter of the North Shore Line and the other great chapters of the South Shore Line, the Chicago, Aurora, and Elgin, the old Chicago streetcar lines, and the Milwaukee Electric Line, look for the full DVD here.